Okay. Well, uh, it's a little bit afternoon and um, I want to be able to make sure that we have as much time as possible for our fantastic conversation today. Uh, for those of you I haven't met on the Zoom screen, my name is Katie Bleach-Strawannenberg. I'm a principal with Public Private Strategies um, and with our fantastic partners at Niskanen, um, co-hosting this four-part webinar series. We um, felt like it was a perfect time for us to bring together um, a diverse group of thought leaders, uh, funders, and, and advocates to talk about the midterm implications on tax policy. And what we've set up is a four-part series. We kicked off on Friday uh, talking about family policy. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about employment tax policy. And I know my, uh, my dear friend Lee will update you on our remaining two panels that will happen in June and July. Um, but what we really thought was, let's, let's bring people together. Let's have a conversation about what um, you know, are the, the possibilities when we're looking at next year and the likelihood that the, the House will flip, uh, potentially the Senate will become tighter. And of course, we have uh, the remaining two years of the Biden-Harris administration um, and really try to, um, I think, bring together voices that are closer together on policy than are not. And so um, this was... Um, uh, a great conversation on Friday about family tax policy. For those of you that weren't able to join us, we will be able to um, send out the recording. We are recording today's panel discussion as well um, so that we can package them and share them widely with people who are really thinking about these policies and how they can navigate um, what is always a challenging situation when we have divided government. Um, I hope that you guys, uh, all those that have participated or are attending today's session, um, we'll utilize the chat function. Uh, we have a great moderator with Judy Conti, but if things are being said or you want to flush out some more um, specifics as our panelists are, are talking about these the meaty issues around employment tax policy, please use the chat. Uh, Judy will do her best to bring those into the conversation. Um, I think one of the benefits of uh, Friday was that we had a really robust chat going and people were, were asking, I think, very um, thoughtful, but I think pointed questions about um, you know, how uh, they as advocates or funders or interested parties are able to talk about these issues um, in a way that uh, potentially will move the ball forward. Um, I want to just thank again our friends um, at Niskanen. Um, Lee will close out our webinar today um, and being great partners in this webinar series, and she will share more about the remaining two sessions that we have. Uh, but with that, and without ado, I want to introduce Judy Conti, Government Affairs Director at the National Employment Law Project, who will moderate our fantastic program today. And so, Judy, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Um, as Katie said, I'm with the National Employment Law Project, an advocacy organization with the mission to build a just and inclusive economy where all workers have expansive rights and thrive in good jobs. We work at the local, state, and national level, and we partner with organizations to help advance our mission through legal and policy solutions, research, capacity building, and communications. Um, we are not experts in tax policy, um, though I think when you want to do any sort of um, policy reform, you have to be involved in tax policy in one way or the other. And I'm sure there are many of you on this call as well um, that don't consider yourselves tax experts but know that it's important to understand what's going on to advance our goals. Some of the things at NELP that we are, are very supportive of and, and work on campaigns to help advance are things like the EITC, the child tax credit, both of which I know you'll hear about today. And hopefully um, we'll hear a little bit too about unemployment insurance, which is funded through taxes, very modest taxes on employers that, that haven't gone up since the 1980s. And um, we are advocating for sensible, gradual, doable reform of that system as well so that we can have a more robust unemployment insurance program throughout this country. Um, so we are very excited to have our four panelists today. I'm going to give very brief introductions so you can get to hearing from them, but I could go on for the full hour about each of these people. Um, Jessica Fulton is the Vice President of Policy for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. She is an expert on issues at the intersection of race and economic policy, and her work focuses on identifying and promoting policies to advance the socioeconomic status of the Black community. 
Chris Griswold is the policy, uh, Amer policy director at American Compass, where he focuses on the economic well being of American workers, families, and communities. He, his expertise spans a wide range of uh, areas, including labor, technology, financial regulation, education, industrial policy, and family policy. Andy Stetner is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. His career as a nonprofit leader spans 20 years of experience modernizing workforce protections and social in in insurance programs at every level. And I'm also pleased to say that Andy was at one point the deputy director of NELP and he ably led our UI team, unemployment insurance team, during the Great Recession and the recovery from it. And last but not least is Matt Darling, an employment policy fellow at the Niskanen Center. Um, Matt works on employment and labor market policy issues with the social policy team. He was previously a vice president at Ideas42, a behavioral economics consultancy, where he managed projects in economic justice, climate change, and domestic health care. Um, we have a number of questions we're going to be asking our panelists today, um, and we're asking all of them to speak fairly succinctly, maybe about two or three minutes tops, because we want to be sure to, to cover a fair amount of the ground um, and then empower you with the tools you need to do a deeper dive by, you know, looking at the websites for these, uh, these wonderful folks and the organizations they work for, where there's a lot of materials they and others have published. Um, and we just want to make sure that we really give you a, a lot of information today so you know where to look next. So we're doing about a five or a 10,000 foot um, look at a tax policy that uh, will hopefully help workers and ways to get it passed. But I think also we'll probably at some point or another touch on the limitations of tax policy and the ability to advance reforms for workers as well. So with that, I am going to turn to our first question and I'm going to ask Jessica Fulton to kick us off. As we approach the midterms, what's the current state of critical pro-worker tax policies like the earned income tax credit? And can we expect anything to move between now and November? Yeah, um, thanks Judy for the question and thanks um, for uh, uh, allowing me to be part of this conversation. I'm really excited um, to hear and learn from everybody. I think I am less than optimistic um, about the prospect of passing uh, pro-worker tax policy. And I think it's actually pretty um, frustrating for me because I think that the earned income tax credit in particular um, is broadly supported. And, and I thought of the EITC expansion as more of a fix than like some radical, um, exciting thing that, that we could get done. Um, and I think I'm gonna explain that with a very, very quick, I know I'm, I'm time limited, very quick personal um, story about how I think the EITC could have helped me as like a new college grad in the great recession. So like I graduate, I get, I can't get a full-time um, job. So I take a full-time unpaid internship and I'm doing like hourly retail work, right? Um, because I'm 22 and don't have a kid, I don't qualify for the EITC. And to me, um, the idea that we kind of cut childless young workers out of this, folks who are, um, uh, graduating maybe from high school or college and just like trying to kind of make it by and we decide, you know, you all actually don't need the support of being able to get this, um, qualify for this tax credit at the end of the year. Like that to me is a flaw. It's something that we should all be able to say like, hey, you know, um, there are, there are low income workers who are just kind of trying to build a foundation for themselves. And so like, to me, that's something that we should all be able to like get behind, agree on, and move on. Um, and instead, we're 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 tax actually taxing people, millions of people, into poverty each year because we don't allow them to to qualify for this particular credit. So, like, I didn't go deep on EITC. Did talk a little bit about what I think it would mean to expand this for um, for young folks in particular, and I think that's just really important. Thanks, Jessica. And I would just note, Jessica has written extensively on the EITC, so just. Google Jessica Fulton, EITC, you will learn everything you need to know. Matt, what would you like to add to this conversation? Yeah, and no, I, I share Jessica's uh, skepticism about, you know, what's going to happen the next few months. If you asked me maybe six months ago, I would say, oh yeah, there's no way they're not going to pass 
you know, some sort of build back better, you know, variant, whether it's watered down or not. And now it's sort of like, okay, you know, you know, it's, it, it's much more of a, a 50, 50 proposition. Um, so, you know, one thing that I know we've been paying really close attention um, in this canon, we talked about uh, on the family tax um, policy things, what well, is the, the child tax credit? And I, I think that sort of pairs very well with Jessica's mm -hmm. points about the EITC. So, you know, the, the one reform to the EITC is saying, hey, we should allow childless workers to have it. And mm -hmm. this, the child tax credit is saying, hey, we should allow, we should make things more open for people who have children and uh, possibly aren't working. Um, and so, you know, that was a huge thing that, you know, a lot of folks po pushed for really hard. It was in uh, the American Rescue Plan for six months and it hasn't been extended. Um, and, you know, the question is, you know, what's going to happen with it? Um, is there going to be something, you know, where it get some variant of it gets, you know, into whatever the final version of Build Back Better is? Um, the other thing that we've been trying to sort of set up is saying, okay, what are the possibles for the possibility for bipartisan versions of this? Uh, because people like Romney, people like Rubio really do like different types of it and trying to work on designing these sorts of programs in a way that, you know, has a chance of getting through a bipartisan um, Senate or bipartisan Congress next year. Um, and I think, that, you know, this, this very much tax connects to uh, what we were talking about, David. It's like, you know, the big question is how is this going to connect with work requirements or uh, making it, you know, how, how people are going to be eligible and trying to figure out a way of passing it that, you know, maybe minimizes the extra administrative burdens, uh, make the hassles that people have to go through to access this while still sort of being amenable to some of the specific requests that some of the senators have made. Fabulous. Andy? Yeah, I, I, I share the idea that Congress is only going to focus on a narrow set of, you know, must pass uh, legislation. <laughs> we would put things like what Matt said, we'll bet better as uh, we're trying to get a Hail Mary pass on it, but we're not even sure the game is being played. Um, but we, we do, you know, we do understand that the SECURE Act 2.0 is likely to pass that will, um, would require automatic enrollment uh, for in retirement uh, plans. So linked to this conversation, you know, today, um, you know, I think would be an important improvement. We're also working on the America Competes Act, which is uh, a, a negotiation that is uh, fruitful, um, would, you know, focus on a number of job creation provisions and uh, subsidies and taxes. Um, you know, they're geared towards jobs. So those are some things that we see as passing, um, but, you know, not a lot of legislative activity given the focus on the elections. Chris, you get to be our cleanup batter. Yes, ma'am. Um, thanks for the for the question. I think, I, I, look, I share my colleagues' skepticism that um, major pro-worker tax policy is likely to, to pass the current Congress. Um, I think it, it, Andrew's point is, is well taken on the, on the, um, let's call it the industrial policy and, and geopolitical competition front. I think we are likely to see some some exciting and, and much needed progress. Um, but on the tax side, I think the thing that that really interests me, um, and 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 Jessica spoke to this, um, is this what I would like to call an emerging uh, consensus on the need to focus the EITC more uh, accurately at at workers especially at workers uh, without children, um, right? The, as we know, the EITC varies currently based on family size. Um, and uh, that leaves childless workers at a, at a relative disadvantage. Um, and look, I mean, it, wages are up, that's good. Uh, unemployment is down, that's good. But the labor force participation rate is a, is a challenge right now, especially for childless workers and it, it, particularly for younger childless men. Um, and part of the purpose of the EITC is to is to help people get into the workforce who aren't currently in the workforce. Um, and you see in uh, folks like Senator Romney's proposals, some of the stuff that we've put out at American Compass, um, interest on the right of center in targeting the EITC, uh, you know, to workers regardless of family size. So I think um, I think it'll be interesting to see whether there's bipartisan consensus in, in the next Congress on the policy design questions, you know, some of which Jessica called a, a needed fix for, for the EITC. Um, and, and we'll see, I think that'll be interesting to watch. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, we're gonna go back to you right away. I think it'll, it'll build perfectly from the end of your answer. There are several scenarios that we can anticipate in November, but it is certainly highly likely to be working with divided government. 
Um, I think something that's that we've displayed already with the answers here, and we are groups that span an ideal, ideal, ideological divide, um, that there is actually a lot that we all agree on. So with that in mind, what future do you envision for policies like EITC, child tax credit, anything else, and how can the philanthropic community prepare to navigate a new political reality as well? So Chris, we'll start with you. Yeah, it's, it's another great question. Um, look, I suppose, maybe this is pedantic, but I suppose it's kind of by definition true that in a divided government, any legislation that has a shot at being enacted will have to be bipartisan in nature. That's just the nature of the game. Um, and if, if it is, as seems likely the case, that congressional Republicans control one or both um, I think from their perspective, they're going to have to have a real economic plan uh, to make good on talk about being the party of parents, the party of supporting families and so on. Right? The difference between campaigning and governing is about to be the, the Republican Party's problem in Congress. This is especially true um, because congressional Republicans are facing the very real likelihood of a post Roe v. Wade landscape. Um, and if the Dobbs decision looks the way the leaked draft opinion makes it seems like it will, uh, that means that the GOP is about to be very answerable for what their plan is to support families, especially lower income and working families. They face an immediate imperative to demonstrate that they have a, a pro-family um, you know, plan beyond just opposing Roe versus Wade. And um, I think that those in the advocacy community that are interested in pro-worker tax policy should be addressing the Republican Party with that in mind. Um, you know, we've talked about Senator Romney uh, already. Uh, his Family Security Act, which he released last year, um, proposes a, a reimagined child tax credit that's very generous and also very streamlined, including incorporating a modified EITC that's targeted at workers regardless of family size. And other Republican senators have made similar proposals, as have organizations like American Compass and others. So there is a real appetite in the more creative wings uh, of the right of center for a, a real family benefit um, to help families that are struggling to make ends meet. And of course, across the aisle, President Biden successfully expanded the CTC temporarily, um, and there's a huge appetite on the right center for action here too. And, and as we talk about frustration, um, that Build Back Better is, is largely stalled at the moment. So I think the place to look is, is there, is in, is in pro-worker tax policy in the context of pro-family tax policy in which there, there might be space for bipartisan uh, innovation and, and compromise. Great. Andy, what would you like to add? I mean, I, I, I would say that it's really a big change in this area. You know, I think, you know, as, you know, first of all, let me all say thanks for this Cannon for inviting me today. I forgot to send Judy for moderating and appreciate the space in this Cannon as, as, as created for these important conversations. Um, you know, I think it's a big sea change. A lot of the areas in family policy, you know, we really were looking um, at the Build Back Better Act. So it was a Democrat versus Democrat kind of conversation. And we didn't really have those bipartisan conversations and, you know, strategizing, you know, for philanthropy or advocates uh, on where are the uh, places of agreement where we can, you know, fashion something uh, that moves families forward. So I think it's a really uh, 180. Um, and, and, you know, from my view, it, it's not just a two year period that we can expect a period longer than that, where, you know, they're going to be a need for, you know, focus on 60 votes in the Senate, you know, for a, a variety uh, of items, um, you know, uh, you know, variety of, you know, divided government possibilities, you know, oh, not just the next two years, but the next, you know, six to 10 years. So we're going to have to be going into a place where we are you know, looking for, you know, incremental uh, achievements uh, and bigger ideas that we can find uh, a bipartisan uh, space. And I think some, you know, really important areas of overlap are, you know, increasing the capacity of the federal government and states to deliver programs effectively uh, and without fraud, um, focusing on, you know, like the hiring and continued uh, employment uh, of marginalized workers, uh, as something that you know, both you know, uh, progressives and conservatives, uh, you know, tend to agree on, um, you know, and I think in that context, you know, the CTC and EITC reform, if not low hanging fruit, you know, seem like an attainable, you know, policy option uh, over the next uh, several years, uh, and I really, you know, uh, appreciate the direction uh, that Chris was uh, talking about. Can we segregate, you know, these 
tax credits to do what they are designed to do? Can we have one that focuses on you know, uh, work uh, and, and making it pay? Uh, and can we have one that um, deals with the, the cost of, of taking care of children? And then maybe, you know, I'll talk a little later, I'll also have a, you know, a better childcare uh, tax credit uh, as well. Um, to deal with that specific expense in addition to the, you know, um, you know, individual expense like, you know, that other kids have to, to deal with. Um, but I think that change is going to, you know, require, you know, some very savvy uh, inside out strategy and alliance building. Uh, I would say um, a lot of period that we've had uh, was maybe a lot of, um, you know, outside, you know, influence. Um, but I think, you know, the, you know, that's still going to be important in the period, but especially when it comes to when we think about these working tax credits, you know, it really has been more of how can we do this on the inside? Uh, what organizations are positioned and positioned, you know, to work together, you know, like the ones on this call, but also I think a much broader panoply that can work uh, together uh, effectively. Yeah, Matt, your turn. Thanks, Judy. Um, you know, one, one thing I'm thinking about with all this is, you know, Previous, you know, in, in 2014 or so, when you had a, a Democratic uh, president, a Republican Congress, you know, a lot of the things that you needed to do to get employment numbers were spend more money or sort of not at that margin is right anymore. And that's, you know, interesting thing that opens up a lot of sort of policy spaces about trying to not just spend more money, but have better functioning programs that can, you know, connect people who are not working to jobs. Um, and I think there's a lot of angles we can use here. Um, you know, obviously COVID is still an issue. Um, it'd be great to be pushing more on worker safety issues uh, via OSHA or other mechanics. Um, it's really, you know, sh sort of shocking that we still <laughs> haven't done too much on paid leave. Um, that's just such a good way of making sure that people who can, who you know, need to leave work for a few weeks can then, you know, re reliably come back. Uh, Jude, I know, you know, you, you're very interested in this, but like, it's, you know, trying to do more on unemployment. Um, there's just such shocking gaps and in the UI system. Um, Chris mentioned fraud earlier, uh, but also, you know, lots of people who were should have been eligible didn't actually receive benefits or didn't receive for months later. And so I think there's a lot that could be done on, you know, the capacity reforms and building these systems better so that, you know, we can detect fraud so that we can get people to people who need it. Um, and, you know, and that can tie into other things like, you know, trying to figure out eligibility and benefits reforms. And then, and then, you know, finally, like, as I said, like, I think there's a lot we can be doing on these angles that I, th I think everyone's interested in doing and trying to figure out, you know, how do we actually get people who aren't working into jobs? Um, and you know, United States spends so much less than every other country in the world. We spend so much less on this than we did in the 1980s. Um, and so figuring out, you know, what can we actually do to, to fund this? And I think, I forget if we made this point earlier, but like, you know, one thing that's been sort of interesting is just thing, the, the lack of sort of innovative thinking um, on the side of states in the recent past. You know, if you look at, you know, we had this huge shortage of labor of, you know, just people desperate to hire and all people could sort of think of is like, oh, maybe we do a return to work package. Maybe we, you know, end UI early. And that's, you know, a very limited policy response. And I feel like there's just like a lot more dimensions we should be exploring. Mm -hmm. And Jessica, what did our esteemed panelists not say that you're dying to say? Yeah, um, I think, you know, in terms of thinking about how we um, get to some interesting and hopefully innovative solutions. I think we really need to um, pull more people into the conversation. I think that we have a tendency um, to kind of rely on the, um, the policies that we have that quite frankly have left like good large segments of the population out, right? So um, I had the opportunity to work on um, a legislative framework, uh, Black Women's Best with the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls and um, Liberation in a Generation, right? And so the, the idea behind the framework is that when we when we decide that we're gonna center kind of the most excluded folks in the population, we can build out policies, right? That, um, that kind of benefit us all. And uh, I know that oftentimes thinking with that framework may be a non-starter for some, for some groups, right? But making sure that the folks who are most likely to be excluded are like in those conversations in the forefront is going to be really important to getting solutions where, you know, if we decide that um, we're making in incremental pro progress, incremental progress can't mean leaving out, for example, um, 
uh, people who aren't working in the child tax credit, right? Like that is a that is a is a is a real um, barrier to forward progress for like our entire economy, right? And so like making sure that we are um, being inclusive um, as we're as we're coming up with new and innovative ideas, I think is going to be key um, mm -hmm. key generally. And I I really hope. Uh, uh, I really hope that folks across across the political spectrum are able to think about that as we kind of move into what's potentially kind of a different phase um, over these next couple of years. Thank you all. And Jessica, I really appreciate you bringing that up. There's a, a phrase that, you know, a lot of movements have like nothing about us without us, right? Um, and, you know, those of us that sit in these ivory towers that we do here in DC or even at the state level, um, we've, we've got, you know, certain areas that we just don't fully understand. We don't see all the ramifications. And so it's, it is so important for us to be involving impacted people in these decisions and in the policy design. So I'm very glad that you raised that. Um, I'm going to ask a series of individual questions. So if, if any of you want to jump in, just, you know, ping me or, or jump right in and uh, with, a, with a quick response. Matt, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've written extensively about labor reforms and, and in fact talked a little bit about some additional ones in your last answer. Um, what specific policies and strategies do you think can be enacted on the federal level? Um, and how can we be sure that they're executed well at the state and local level? And you know, I, I know that again, I, I sort of hinted at this in the beginning. This is a, um, a panel on, on tax policy. Um, but you know, I, I think there's certainly a question of, of where the limits of tax policy are in terms of um, doing good behavior. For example, yeah, yeah. paid leave is something you mentioned. I know there are proposals out there to provide um, enhanced tax credits for employers who voluntarily enact good paid leave programs. Um, there, there are some that think based on other tax credit policy in the past that that rewards employers who would do it anyway and doesn't really move the needle. So it's it's a lot for you to address in about three minutes, but if you wanna <laughs> take a stab at some some top level thoughts, that would be great. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. And I appreciate the sort of, you know, the, 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 the line between tax policy and social insurance policy, you know, is, is pretty thin, right? I mean, you know, again, the, the, it, it's so funny with, you know, we were talking about the child tax credit earlier and, you know, that's very much sort of something that you could just think of as, as a child allowance. And that's, you know, what it's called and, Britain and Canada, but you know, within the United States, you know, we do everything through the tax code. Um, so, I mean, I mentioned some of the UI reforms um, earlier, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on this. But, like, you know, one thing I would be really interested in, in seeing, and I think you know, has a potential next Congress is thinking about sort of eligibility reforms, right? So, this was a huge benefit um, during the pandemic, and, and um, or, or during the period it was law in the pandemic. But you know, making it a program that exists that is, you know more people can be eligible for. Um, and that could be people who are under gig employment, right? So people who are, are not sort of um, W-2 workers, but 1099 workers. And then going to some of the points that Chris mentioned about pro-family policies, you know, thinking about parents returning to the labor force, right? So those are people who are, you know, moving from not in the labor force to being, you know, someone actively searching for jobs, but then they're actually not provided with the same sort of unemployment benefits that everyone else in, in that situation would be. Um, and so, you know, there's some bills that are looking at this like a job seeker lounge, which saying, okay, you know, if you don't uh, fall into this into sort of more standardized ways, um, can we make a, you know, figure out a way of connecting you to it? Um, and then the other thing, you know, you mentioned, you know, how do we get this to work on the federal and the state's level? And I think, you know, one thing I'm always sort of conscious of is, you know, we, you know, obviously there's, United States has a federal system, states are going to be customizing their programs in a lot of different ways, but especially with UI, you know, it's just such a sort of mess and it's so hard for people to even understand, you know, how benefits differ from state to state. Um, going back to some of uh, the points that Andy raised earlier about how, you know, we have, you know, the EITC and the CTC and they're both half trying to do the other person's job. Uh, you still see the same thing in UI benefits. You know, some states that say, oh yeah, we're going to have, you know, an, an additional benefit for child dependence. Um, and, and you're sort of saying, well, you know, hope that if we do have, you know, a CTC, if we do have a robust EITC program, those things become less important and trying to figure out, you know, can we standardize this mm -hmm. so that we have a framework that, you know, will let us build on everything, let states customize things, 
but also makes the system easier for people to navigate, uh, less confusing. And, you know, and, and like I said, like something that can be executed well at the state level, as opposed to, you know, each state independently, you know, trying to come up with their own system with, you know, the limited resources that they have. Yeah, you know, you're singing my tune there, Matt. I appreciate you raising it. And, you know, also would note, as you were saying, and others were saying, CTC and EITC should be completely complementary, but in some ways, they're because of the failures in our policy, they're trying to do the job of the other. I think we saw very much during the, the, the worst of the pandemic that UI often functioned as a, a sort of paid leave program because we didn't have one of those that was effective enough. So um, it's, it's another point of how we need these programs to really interact appropriately. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Jessica. Um, while we're on pandemic, we are obviously still in the throes of it and it continues to evolve with new variations of the disease, new impacts to the labor market, new levels um, that governments, state, local governments are or are not willing to try to um, get in there and, and deal with either mask mandates or vaccines. I mean, we, we've uh, really reached a point where there's just so much pandemic fatigue, if you will. Um, so it is it, the, the labor market has drastically changed. The needs and expectations of workers have changed. Um, where do you find that we've had some of the best successes and failures or shortcomings of the American Rescue Plan? And what should we be doing for the future of pandemic? The question is pandemic recovery, but really like, I think it's, it's less about pandemic recovery and, and like learning how to live in the midst of an evolving pandemic. So if, if you could comment on that, successes, shortcomings of the ARP and where we need to go. Yeah, um, I think the thing that's most exciting to me, um, and this is kind of a, a, an overarching thing in my mind, is that we, we saw what government can do in response to a crisis, right? Um, we know that a good number of folks were able to kind of remain on solid footing. Um, I think about the child tax credit and knowing personally people who, because they were able to get those advanced payments, they went from kind of sleeping on a family member's couch to being able to save up um, a security deposit to get their own apartment, right? Like, and I think that is a meaningful impact um, that we're now able to say, like, if, if we are in crisis, that people should be able um, to uh, depend on some kind of backstop, right? So that they don't fall further behind. Um, I think we have a lot to do in terms of uh, stabilizing the economy. Like I know we've had a lot of job growth and um, unemployment has gone down. And I think that like, absolutely we should be celebrating that. But to be clear, the black unemployment rate is 6.2%, right? So that is more than double what the overall unemployment rate is. And that means that we need to be really intentional about, um, about how we support folks who are still really struggling in the labor market. And I think if we look particularly at young folks across race, but in particular, black and Latino young folks, the unemployment rate is really sky high and um, needs, to, needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I think um, at the Joint Center, we, we surveyed a couple months ago about 600 black folks nationwide and about 70% said that their personal economic situation was either had either gotten worse or stayed the same in the past year. And to me, that means that our recovery is not meaningfully, um, meaningfully hitting black families in a way that I would hope that it would considering the investments we've been making. And so um, I think, you know, folks have talked about paid leave, folks have talked about unemployment insurance, right? There are policies that didn't really reach everyone. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, a number of folks, including people on this panel, have been thinking about how we need to make reforms um, so that so that some of our policies can more meaningfully reach all populations. And I think we should think about that. Um, at the Joint Center in particular, we are paying a lot of, ten of attention to um, how we think about workforce training. So our workforce policy program, led by my colleague, Dr. Connordale, um, has been um, uh, uh, proposing uh, changes to the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, for example, as it goes through the authorization to make sure that it connects workers, not just to any job, right, but to like good jobs that they can actually um, support their families with. I think 
we're also thinking about kind of implementation in terms of making sure that black communities are connected to affordable and accessible broadband because we know that lots of folks when everybody went online just did not have that option and so um you know those are kind of some things that we're looking towards as like that we're in arp and we're we haven't quite seen you know um the move all the way through down to the community level yet but we're we're being hopeful about Chris, I'm going to turn to you um, with a related question. The pandemic exposed significant gaps in the labor market and how both employers and tax policies meet or don't meet the needs of everyday employees. What new strategies do you think the philanthropic community and nonprofit advocates need to focus on to help workers and employers, especially in light of a reinvigorated labor movement? It's a great question. Um, I took my headphones out. Can you uh, hear me okay? We can. Perfect. No, um, did, Jessica mentioned how important it is to not overstate the, the recovery, right? And, and, and the fact that a lot of folks are, are still struggling. I think it's also really important not to overstate the labor movement's current vitality, right? You, you mentioned a, a reinvigorated labor movement. It, it is certainly true that Americans are generically more favorable to, to labor unions than they have been in, in a long time. Two thirds of Americans are generally supportive of unions. And we've certainly seen some individual uh, victories for organized labor, right? The Amazon labor union, Staten Island was frankly inspiring story. I, I was thrilled. Um, but the Amazon labor union story was so striking in my opinion, precisely because we don't really expect union drives to succeed in the United States. It was news because it was so unusual uh, and unexpected. The, the reality is that 6% of American private sector workers are union members. Uh, American workers very much want collective voice and power at work. Um, our research shows that. Many other people's research shows that um, workers in the U.S. experience a huge gap between the voice they say they have at work and the voice they say they want at work. And that gap remains uh, very large. Um, and the reason for that gap between uh, what workers want and what they have, I think, presents some really important challenges, both for the establishment on the right of center and for the establishment on the left of center. Um, the, the traditional libertarian GOP economic establishment that really needs to grapple with the fact that it is not offering the mechanisms for worker voice and power, collective worker voice and power that workers want. Um, collective worker voice is good uh, and the GOP needs to grapple with that at an institutional level. It's also true that uh, we punish union busting pretty lightly, if at all, in the US and there's a lot of underhanded activity uh, and Democrats are right that we should, we should fix that. Um, on the other hand, it is also true uh, that current models of labor organizing um, often as champion, championed by the Democratic Party, don't, don't seem to be fully providing what American workers want. Um, even while they're generically favorable to unions kind of in general, um, all of the research I've seen, including you know, stuff we've done, but others as well, uh, including left of center organizations, seems to bear out that workers are fairly ambivalent towards the specifics of what current labor organizing models offer. Um, that's especially true with regards to union involvement in national level partisan politics. Um, but even beyond that, there, there's just a much wider range of options that workers want in terms of models they could use to organize. Um, there are a lot of other really interesting ways to do this that other countries have have shown can work, right? And I think I think DC is going to have to figure out how to offer American workers a much wider range of uh, of uh, organizing options, from kind of collaborative works councils like Germany does to sectoral level bargaining across industries or regions uh, to devolving benefits administration to worker controlled organizations, um, perhaps in exchange for, for getting out of campaign politics. You know, we, we poll tested that kind of proposal uh, and it's th three to one uh, overwhelmingly popular. Um, and then the last thing I would say, about it, so to, to the answer to your question, I think is that the advocacy community should be pushing Congress to get really creative. And, and that's gonna require pushing both parties to get out of their current kind of ingrained attitudes towards the meaning and role of worker organi organizing. Um, and, and you know, we've talked a lot about UI uh, and it's really important. I mean, one of the things that we could get creative about, for example, would be devolving unemployment 
uh, uh, you know, insurance administration to worker organizations. Um, a lot of European countries do this you know, under the Ghent system. Um, and it works really well. These organizations are accountable to their workers in a much more direct way than state or federal governments are. Um, they are more agile, which we saw in the pandemic. Um, state, you know, this, the pandemic broke state UI systems that had been underinvested in for years. Um, but these, you know, you, you let workers do it themselves through organizations they control. It can work a lot better. Um, so I think I think I think my, my answer to your question is that the, the nonprofit or, or advocacy community needs to needs to push Congress to get a lot more creative about what workers can do for themselves um, if if given a a wider menu of organizing options than they have right now. Andy, um, we've already previewed, obviously, the um, Supreme Court's expected decision in Roe v. Wade will likely exacerbate the need for major reforms for working parents. What specific tax policies and pro-worker policies must the new Congress take up in order to ensure that employees and families are supported, that the labor markets don't continue to experience disruption? And the $64,000 question is how likely do you think they will actually do that? Well, in All thing, in three minutes or less. <laughs> one thing I would just say is that what we have mentioned so far on the call is inflation. You know, um, you know, the workers' wages are not keeping up with prices. We're moving at a period where the maybe the demand-driven inflation is slowing, but those high prices will maintain, uh, you know, for a number of years. So the policies we're talking about ought to be a response, helping people's wages go farther, you know, through um, the EITC, uh, the CITC. We're also very focused on child care, uh, which directly relates to your frame uh, there, Judy, in terms of uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, there will be a big cliff in child care funding in 2024, where American Rescue Plan Act funds must be spent by, um, and we're going to need, you know, a, a, a real increase because it's a market that doesn't work. So while we support um, improvements to the child care and development tax credit, you can't buy something from a market that doesn't work. So we need um, you know, continue funding through the child care and development block grant funding uh, with a real focus on quality uh, and the availability of affordable uh, child care. One other thing that I think in this period we need to touch on briefly is there's going to be uh, maybe as many as a million people that will be long term disabled uh, because of COVID. How do we help those people get back to work uh, and access uh, benefits? And I really love the conversation we had uh, about unemployment. I uh, really appreciate uh, Matt. Uh, talking about, you know, is there a set of basic standards? We know there's some bipartisan idea around helping people get back to work, having technology work, but it, can we come to some idea that this benefit should, that the states offer, you should have a, a decent amount, a decent length, um, involve community groups, um, like Chris was talking about, to reach um, those disenfranchised populations, um, you know, including, uh, you know, Black women who don't access benefits. And we may be facing, um, you know, another recession more quickly than we have in the past um, because of the very crazy nature of how the economy has behaved. We can't go uh, into another recession uh, and leave out people that don't qualify for unemployment benefits, gig workers, low wage workers. When I see Jessica, I think of Alex's work in um, her colleague in Georgia, we're having the federal benefits. We're able to um, erase some of the long term racial gaps in terms of getting unemployment benefits. So we're going to either have to have a set of federal standards or another federal program that comes in that levels out uh, some of those uh, mixes. Um, let me just lastly, uh, you know, ask, you know, I, I would think that maybe the tax area can go into the job training area. Uh, potentially, we are big fans of the English apprenticeship levy, which says either you offer an apprenticeship um, to your employees or you pay a tax. So people can get that uh, type of training in other places. So we're a big supporter of that idea that um, that'll be a more effective way of helping to incentivize training um, and getting at really what employers are providing, uh, which, you know, rather than just having government provide training, what are employers doing to train uh, their own workers, especially at a time when unemployment is low, but not a lot of people are in the jobs um, that would be able to sustain themselves uh, and their family. So let me stop there. Um, and I know we have another question we're trying to get through. We've got one final question. And like, I'm just so proud of my panelists. You've all been so succinct. I did not think there was any way we were gonna get through everything and we did. So congratulations. Um, certain elements of the American Rescue Plan failed to be administered well or at all in some state and local communities. 
Can you name for me one administrative reform that must be implemented in order to ensure that national level pro worker policies are successful at the state level? Um, Andy, I'm going to start with you. Well, for one thing, we know these programs will move online uh, in the future, um, and that had created a great risk, uh, you know, with criminals that tried to take advantage of them, but it it we are needing we need a way to effectively allow people digitally to verify uh, who they are in a way that it's not uh, discriminatory uh, in the way that the facial recognition technology that the IRS uh, you know rolled out was and that has off ramps for those individuals um, who cannot get through that online process you know I, I would be in favor of the postal service uh, playing that role in the same way it does for the Department of State uh, for your passport. Uh, we're we're very happy to see, uh, people in the states are very happy to see that Maryland and we became the second state to allow digital driver's licenses. We're going to need to move to more and more digital forms of identity for people to access uh, these benefits, especially when it's coming uh, through the tax system, which is one that doesn't really have uh, an infrastructure for verifying for people who th who they are. Great, Matt. Um, I, I'm going to build off Andy's stuff because I, I think you know that that digital point is really important. Um, one of the things I got really passionate about uh, last year was you know all the states who announced these big you know return to work bonuses that you could get when you got a new job, and then you'd go to their websites and the websites were awful, right? That you, you and what ended up happening is maybe about three percent of the people who are eligible for these programs in any given state actually received it, and so you know just trying to figure out you know these these sorts of barriers are just huge. And I think, you know, one thing is that we have to just think about is like, you know, if you're going to have these federal systems, like we need to recognize that, you know, sometimes states aren't going to have the capacity to sort of run these on their own and trying to figure out, you know, what are ways that we can build um, systems for this, that you can build um, ways for states to, you know, have resources to do more creative, innovative work, but also systems that allow them to say, okay, like here's this great program that worked in Colorado, let's see if we can get it to work in Nebraska. So trying to figure out some sort of reforms that allow us to, to have our cake and eat it too from the sort of perspective of the, that state federal trade-off. Yeah. Chris. Yeah, I, I think I would just return to what I said earlier, which is I think sometimes we get caught in this binary of, well, what should the federal government do and what should the states do and how do we split that up and how do we make that work? And those are not the only two options. Um, and not only are they not the only two options, I think the alternatives might be more appealing to both the right and the left simultaneously if we do it right. Um, and if we find creative ways to build mechanisms for workers to have their own say, but both decision-making power and administrative responsibility in some of these areas. Um, that What does that do? That gets the government uh, out, of the, out of the equation in a way that I think will appeal to the traditional right. It empowers workers both individually, but also collectively and makes the value proposition of joining a union or a worker control organization much better, is good across the board. Um, and it improves potentially uh, the efficacy and efficiency and agility of these programs like unemployment insurance. Um, and so from my perspective, there's nothing not to like about getting smart um, about breaking out of this binary between, between what should be federal and what should be, be state. Um, there are more options than that. And to the extent possible, I think we should be thinking in terms of what can American workers decide and administer for themselves, which will require um, policy that, that gives them mechanisms to do that. And then last, but certainly not least, Jessica, you get to close us out. Yeah, um, I think the, the most important thing we can probably do is to make sure that we are collecting and analyzing and uh, making public the appropriate data, right? So thinking about how policies are implemented across race, across geographies, across gender, across disability status, right? Those are, those are um, opportunities to think about whether or not we're reaching all the folks that we intend to reach. I think um, when I think about, like I heard the, the digital point and I was like, yeah, but like a quarter of the folks in the black rural South. So that's like the what 150 or so counties in the South that are both rural and at least 35% black, they don't even have the option 
to subscribe to high speed internet, right? So like we're almost writing them off by um, moving everything online because like they're not gonna get it, right? And so I think we don't know that unless we are paying close attention to um, where there's take up in particular policies. And I think I would say that um, because of the Biden administration's racial equity executive order, our agencies are, are required to, to think deeply about how they're collecting and analyzing and making public data about who gets to benefit or, or who um, actually is negatively affected by the policies that we're implementing. So I think that would be my, um, my final point. Excellent. And thank you again to all these panelists. I hope that the things they have said have made everybody on here want to dig a little deeper, want to research a little more, and want to get involved in working together and hopefully across ideological divides to make some of this a reality. With that, I am going to close up this portion of the panel and turn it over to the wonderful Lee Gibson to wrap up for us. Yeah, thank you, Judy, for an expertly uh, moderated panel and to the panelists for their terrific conversation today. Against the backdrop of um, intense partisanship, I've, I've been really heartened by the opportunities to improve the prospects and security of American workers that you identified today, and especially excited about where your insights overlapped. You've certainly set the table for further conversations between policy organizations and the philanthropic community to ensure that the sector has the capacity to address these important opportunities. Let me join uh, with public private partnerships to again thank the Rockefeller Foundation for their sponsorship of this series. We have two more exciting conversations on the calendar ahead. The first uh, is healthcare on June 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And then with a break for the July 4th weekend, we resume uh, with business policy conversation on July 13th at 3 p.m. We very much hope you'll all be able to join us again for those conversations. Thank you to everyone. <laughs>